Linda Hirsch, and this is EdCast, a program created and produced by educators for everyone interested in education. The coronavirus pandemic has shifted learning from the physical classroom to the virtual one. Throughout the nation, our students are learning at home, interacting with their teachers and peers via a computer screen. For most students, teachers, and parents, the change was a sudden one, leaving teachers little time to prepare and pushing parents and students into the world of homeschooling. The semester is now drawing to a close and the finish line is in sight. It's time to reflect on what we've learned about remote learning and its impact on student success. Today, I'm joined by three teachers spanning kindergarten through high school and the parent of a second grader. We'll look at the challenge, victories, and the future of the online classroom, now on EdCast. Andrea Fabrizio is an Associate Professor of English and Chair of the English Department at Osos Community College, CUNY. She lives in Highland Mills, New York with her husband and seven-year-old son who is a second grader at Central Valley Elementary School in the Monroe Woodbury Central School District. Rafael Perez Segura teaches Spanish English dual language kindergarten at the Haketi Community Charter School. His teaching centers on using children's narratives in their learning. His students have been exploring some of the social emotional aspects of the pandemic. Eileen Orr is a fifth grade teacher at the Haketi Community Charter School. She's an experienced bilingual educator and she's worked with bilingual students in pre-K through fifth grade in Washington DC and New York City. She is particularly interested in culturally relevant math education. Gregory Van Voorhees, known affectionately by his students as Mr. V, is an 18-year veteran public high school English and drama teacher at Millennium Art Academy in the Soundview area of the South Bronx. Gregory shares his passions as an independent filmmaker and theater director with all his students. Welcome all of you today. I'm so happy to see you all. We're gonna start with Rafa, our kindergarten teacher, because really I am very concerned about with how this age group has been handling online learning. So tell us a little bit about what you found out about this experience, Rafa. What I have found out is definitely it's a big challenge. Uh, my priority this whole time has been my kids' social and emotional uh, and physical safety. And uh, that's been done through check-ins with parents, through check-ins with children, and trying to integrate as much of their current experience into the work we're doing online. What have you found to be some of the biggest challenges with this particular age group? Well, one challenge has been the actual act of doing Zoom lessons. Mm. Developmentally, some of my children are very distraught when they get on a Zoom because they see everybody else and they think that everyone is together except for them. So it's difficult for them to understand sometimes that we are all in separate areas. So as a result, Zoom check-ins for me have never been a requirement. Rather, they've been an invitation for children that do benefit from it and who want to talk to others and who are comfortable doing that. Were they able to use the computer equipment? What was that like for them? We used a program called Seesaw, which works on a desktop, which works on an iPad, or it can work on a phone. And I, as we probably all know, our kids from a very young age are very adept at using tablets. <laughs> so uh, children with access to tablets have found it pretty straightforward on how to use the software. But that being said, uh, not everything translates very well. Reading instruction doesn't translate very well. Uh, and children have struggled at times with understanding certain mechanics such as recording yourself and, um, or, uh, or, 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 or what buttons to press to make sure you submit correctly. So that's, that's definitely been a challenge. I know you have tried to use this time to help students really cope with all of the many crises that are swirling around them and you've used some materials to help them make sense of what's going on. Let's take a look at some of the things that you've been doing and maybe you can tell us how they've helped students. One of the things that you've used with your class is a calendar, which we're all taking a look at now. Tell us what this calendar is for. 
This calendar is to help children to begin to conceptualize the idea of time, uh, the idea of the school year ending, uh, and in the context of Hecate, unfortunately, the idea of Hecate closing its doors. So they will all be going to different schools next year. So uh, this calendar, every day during my writing time, I circle the day that we're on, I X the day before, and I always review with them when our stepping up ceremony is on the 15th and when the last day of school is on the 19th. And this calendar also serves as a jumping off point for content. So for writing, we're doing memoirs. And so we talk about in other months, what have we done and what do they remember? In so math, we're looking at the idea of how many days are left and writing number sentences to match that, for example. So you bring it all together in a yeah. comprehensive way. Let's go back to memoir and memory. You did some work with students. Tell us a little bit about what this was for and why you had them do this kind of work. Yeah, this is an ongoing project still. So this is uh, a page from one of my children uh, who says, I remember playing with blocks and I've been encouraging them during writing the past week and through the next two weeks to think about what do they remember from school. And I do this because this is a way to hold space for children to process the idea that there was a time before and that I can still have these memories with me now. So by the end of the school year, they will each have their own book that they made and that they'll be able to share with each other to take with them wherever they go. And this is the math. Let's take a look at this quickly. Yeah, I, I just bring up the math because uh, it's something that has translated particularly well. Uh, since we do math largely through problem solving. So I have not formally taught subtraction or addition extensively. I have them directly model what's going on. So for example, in this story, Elizabeth has five Legos. The child put out five Legos. They match the problem. This is not something I told them to do. This is something that kids do at this age. Um, and then she gives Jonathan two Legos. And how many Legos does Elizabeth have now? So, and, and in this case, these are dots that they are circling the parts that they see because at the end of the day, we're trying to get to the big, deeper idea that addition and subtraction has to do with parts in relation to their holes. So these are just different ways to explore that. Yeah. So just quickly to wrap up, what are the things about kindergarten kids? You know, we always refer to these as the magic years. These are very important developmental years in school for children, mostly because we see kindergarten as a socialization process as well. What has been the effect, if any, on this age group, in this environment now, of not being together as a group? Has something been lost? Has something been gained? Uh, a lot has been lost. During these years, a large part of child's brain development is through the social interactions. Arguably, the majority of their brain development is through their connections with others. And as a result of being isolated from each other and in very different types of circumstances, uh, they're not, they're not getting the opportunity to engage with others, other friends, and they're not getting the opportunity to be part of a really a larger community, I think, uh, at least in the school. Uh, and it's really, they're really at the mercy right now, even more so than before of the social inequities mm -hmm. uh, that exist in our society right now. Thank you. I, I wanna move over to Andrea now because you are the mother of a seven-year-old, so wearing your mom hat today, and not your educator hat, um, or maybe both together. Tell us a little bit about what has it been like being home with a seven-year-old and what's been going on? It's been very difficult. Um, I mean, it's wonderful to be home, of course, with, with my son, and that's great to have all this time together, but in terms of working still full-time remotely from home and having him do his learning from home, um, just balancing those two things has been very hard. Um, and I say his teacher has done a wonderful job of sending home a reasonable schedule of time and activities, um, but it's still hard, you know, to manage a, a day's worth of Zoom meetings and emails. And then, well, he can do the work that is there independently, you know, following the direction, finding the directions and submitting in the right place and, and doing all the things online, he still needs help to do those things. So um, just the balance of time 
has been really hard and it's been really hard on him because learning in front of a screen is not the same thing as learning with your friends and learning with your teacher and, and make mom becoming a teacher has been a very difficult transition for him. How do you think he's been handling the being at home part? I'm sure he's happy to be with you. Um, what has that been like for him, the not being in school? Um, I mean, we, we try as much as we can to have some sense of structure in the day, but it's really hard um, and he's bored. He's really bored. He's, he's lonely. He misses his routine. And I think he misses having his own space, you know, getting out of the house and having his own little life uh, that he has at school. Um, so he may be thrilled to not have to go to school, but at the same time, this is school. Uh, so it's a very complex emotion he's been struggling with. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a challenge for him. And then doing schoolwork at home, he doesn't want to do it. And he'll say, you know, I'm home. I don't want to do school at home. I do school at school, you know, so it's been hard for him to, to make that adjustment that home has now become school. Is he able to do any of this work on his own? I'm sure as we get to the higher grades, the students can do it on their own, but a second grader, what's that like for him? I mean, he, the concepts he can do on his own, like once the screen is up and the, the reading passage is there, he can read it on his own and he can do the math problems on his own, but he needs help with where to click. You know, um, the typing has been a struggle. Um, you know, I, I've, I've become a scribe because it's just, it's too frustrating. <laughs> so the typing is a struggle. Um, all of that has been difficult. I mean, he's got the hang of Zoom meetings now. He can hand, you know, he can unmute himself and he can turn off his camera when he's, when he's bored, <laughs> which he, he does sometimes. Um, but, you know, the actual switching from the math folder to the reading folder to the writing folder, he needs help with. Has there been any plus for you that you've seen? I mean, the only plus is that I really get a lot of insight into what he, he's learning, although I don't know if this is reflective of what he would have been learning if he was in school. So it's nice to see the curriculum so closely, um, but that's really, you know, that's really it. I, 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 this has not been an, a good semester for him, and I, I feel bad too. I mean, when you said about the magic year, second grade is also sort of the end of the kid school, you know, and third grade is more serious business. So I... I feel bad that he's lost this last term of second grade. I'm wondering if we can maybe hear a little bit from Matthew himself, if you don't mind. I know we, I asked if maybe he'd like to just say a few words to us about what it's been like for him. Do you think he might? Yeah, I'm How are you? Good. Good. Matthew, can we see your face up a little bit more? There you go. Hey, hi, good to see you. So Matthew, this has been a very different kind of school year for you, right? The past couple of months have been very different, right? Uh -huh. You've been home and you've been learning with the computer a lot. So what's that been like? Do you like this new way of school? No. Okay, well tell us about it. What don't you like? That we're in our house and we still have to do work. It's basically like longer homework. What makes it hard to do the work, Matthew? That we're in my our house, and that we have a puppy. So, what do you like? Is there anything that you like about this? About mm -hmm. being at home and doing your schoolwork from home? Is there anything that you like? Only that it's a little bit shorter. Ah, okay. And what do you like the least? What's the worst part of it? That we're in our house that you're in the house. Do one last thing, Matthew. In the fall, do you want to go back to school or would you like to stay home and do your work from home? I'd rather stay here so I can play with my puppy and watch him. <laughs> home with your new puppy, I get it. Okay, <laughs> thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Aileen, let's go to you and talk about the fifth grade, all right? So tell us, what have you seen as some of the big challenges with the children that you're working with? Yeah, so I'd like to echo some of, um, you know, what Rafa and Andrea have talked about. I think that the challenges um, can kind of be categorized in three main buckets. So there's the technology and digital literacy challenges, uh, the pedagogical challenges, and then the social emotional challenges. Um, and so the biggest thing for me has been trying to balance um, the social emotional needs of the students and trying to really understand where each student is at, um, what you know, what's going on with each family since everybody is dealing with this a little bit differently, and then balancing that with the instructional needs um, of each student. 
I want to take a look at some of the instructional work that you've been doing with your students. Okay, so let's take a look and tell us what it is and what it's supposed to help them with. What are we looking at here? So this is a tool that we're using called Pear Deck. Um, it allows students to interact with the material in a multimodal way. Um, so it has various different types of tools, including the drawing tools that you're seeing here. Um, so this is the objective that tells the students what they're going to be working on for the day. And they're using the drawing tools to be able to highlight the important words or the important information. It's a way to help them process what the lesson is going to be about. And the Pear Deck tool allows the students to interact in multiple different ways with the material, including listening to audio of my voice that's explaining what's on the slide. Um, and then they can respond um, to different prompts on the slides, either through typing responses, there's some multiple choice questions, there's some questions where they can drag and drop to respond. Um, and so we found this tool really useful as a way to provide um, an interactive model that doesn't necessarily have to be done live. And the next one, this? Yes, yeah. so this is also the drawing, um, the drawing tool, but I think it's helpful just to have students be able to um, manipulate the mathematical concepts. In the classroom, we use a lot of hands-on manipulatives, um, such as base 10 blocks or um, you know, fraction strips, but that's harder in the um, online context. Mm -hmm. And so math is a little bit difficult to do on things like a Google Doc. Um, so we found this to be a way that they can still be able to manipulate the, um, the mathematical concepts and not just be, uh, you know, just listening to a video. We really wanted to find a way that could be, like I said before, multimodal, a little bit more hands-on. Um, and we found that not all students were able to attend live Zoom meetings, so providing um, the flexibility to have that self-paced um, student work was important. I want to ask, I guess maybe the key question in all of this, how do you feel your students are learning and compared to how you feel they were learning in your face-to-face -face classroom? Yeah, it's, it's math. I mean, you know. It's really difficult to assess that at the end of the day. I think that's um, one of the biggest challenges as a teacher is that it's hard to really know whether the work that they're submitting is work that they're doing independently, is that work that they're doing, um, you know, getting help from a family member or perhaps using tools like a calculator or um, other materials that are available online. And so sometimes when we get the student work, it's really hard to parse out um, you know, especially if it's done correctly, it, it's hard to tell whether that is, um, you know, their own work. If there are mistakes, that's where I can get a better sense of where they're at because the mistakes really tell a story about what misconceptions they might have and, you know, what gaps might be there that I can help to address with the student. Um, and in the live Zoom lessons, you get a little bit more of a sense because you have more of that interaction, a little bit more back and forth um, when they respond to questions. So I think that, you know, for some students, it's worked really well. There's certain students who had chronic absenteeism that are now attending daily lessons and submitting their work, and it's actually worked really well for them. Um, there are some students that haven't been able to keep up with the work, and, you know, for them, that means that they're, they're missing out on almost a third of the school year. So it is truly varied. Great. Let's go to the high school student then, Greg. Let's hear from you. What have you seen as some of the biggest challenges? I think the challenges have, short, uh, have sort of shifted as the time has gone on. Uh, originally, it was technology. It was making sure that every student had uh, the proper necessities that they needed to learn. Um, and once our school was able to get everybody with uh, the right materials, um, it was motivation. And then after motivation, uh, the, the struggles of motivation were finally starting to, uh, to, to lessen the world around us has become a, a challenge. And um, students are angry, students are hurt, uh, they're stuck inside. And, and I think the struggle, just with everything combined, um, that, that has been the most challenging right now. Let's go to that, because I know you've really done some work with your students dealing with the George Floyd, and, you know, with that terrible incident and tragedy. And, and so let's talk about what have you done with your students? Sure, so I have, the, I, have, uh, I have the luxury at my school of being not only an English teacher, but also a theater director. And uh, I think the arts has been uh, a godsend for the kids really lately. Um, with the uh, suspension, at least, of the Regents exams, 
uh, we've been able to really use art as a way to keep students home, keep them productive, uh, give them a place to reflect, give them a place to express themselves. And so my theater classes, uh, we viewed Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing together. Um, and this was just a few days after the murder of George Floyd. Um, and then afterward, we did a table read of the play. And um, that, that proved to be extremely powerful. Let's take uh, a look at that table read. I think we have some footage of that. Let's take a look at that. Sure. And action. What do you want? I want my money. What do you get paid? You don't work here no more. Sal, I want my money. Your money couldn't even begin to pay for that window you broke. Forget your window. Radio Rahim is dead. I know he's dead. I was here, remember? He's dead because of his buddy. That piece of garbage started all this. He's responsible for that kid's death, and he wanted to close me, and you stood there like a mute and watched him burn. I was watching. I watched the cops kill Radio Rahim. You're going to get over with the insurance anyways. Sal, you know what to do. What's wrong with you? You think this is about the money? I don't give a damn about money. You see this place? I built this place with my damn bare hands. Every light socket, every tile, me, with these damn hands. Let's talk about this combination then of art and technology. What has that done for your students in dealing with this crisis? Uh, as a theater teacher, it's very new uh, and a challenge. Normally, we're in a very uh, physical space. We're on the stage. Um, but this is, you know, with the times, we all have to grow. We all have to change. And this is something that I think the students and I are, are learning together. Um, but again, I think this is something where I think we should get a little bit uh, more familiar with because I don't know if it's leaving anytime soon. Um, and... I think they've done a remarkable job staying with it, um, being present, being active, being proactive, um, expressing themselves, being a community. We lost the physical community, but we've, we've maintained that virtual community and family that we've been working so hard to build and maintain. Uh, so it, I, again, I think the arts are a beautiful thing at this time um, and something that I hope won't be lost in the future. So your experience from this, Greg, what would you say was the most positive outcome of this online learning environment and the thing that you thought you liked least about it? I think the thing I liked the least uh, came from the fact that with younger, with younger children, parents were a little bit more present, could be a little bit more present. But when you've got a 17-year-old, you're not going to have mom <laughs> wake you up and check your homework assignment and go over the assignment with you. You're almost out in the real world. And um, I think while they're not, while they are older, they're not yet fully adults and they haven't been uh, exposed to that responsibility just yet. So to, to have that thrust upon them on a Tuesday in the middle of a semester uh, where they now have to be accountable for themselves uh, was the most challenging. And I'd say probably the most rewarding, maybe the most surprisingly rewarding was how we have maintained that family that we created at the beginning of the year and, and just have been there for each other, uh, them for me as well. Um, we, we're getting each other through it. I want to open this up now to everyone because the key point now is moving forward. One of the concerns that we're all having, of course, is what are students learning and are they going to be ready for the work that's coming in the future? Yeah, I'm most concerned about students who have particular learning needs, so students with IEPs or students who are learning English. Um, I think it is a lot harder to provide those services online, particularly if there's also tech challenges or challenges going on at home. Um, and so those students are at the biggest risk of falling behind because they're maybe not provided with as many services or the instruction is, you know, there's only one way you have to learn online. If that doesn't really work well for you and your particular learning needs, um, then that, that is a real challenge and a real risk for those students. Do you think your fifth grade students are going to be ready for the work of sixth grade? I think a good portion of them are not.
Well, I'm not sure if my son is going to be ready for third grade. It's something that really worries me. I mean, we complete his assignments together. We work, you know, I, I do a lot of supplemental lesson planning with him. I don't know if I'm teaching him things the way I'm supposed to be teaching them, particularly math. I mean, I'm, I'm teaching him stuff the way I learned math, which I know is very different um, from the way children are learning it. No, I know a lot of the work he usually does is do repetition of things and nothing is getting repeated. It's a new thing every day and I don't know what's going to stick. And Ross, what do you think? I mean, pre-K and K are so important. I think even the idea of falling behind is loaded with a lot of assumptions, is loaded with the idea of what is the standard. Okay. Is it actually appropriate? that everybody's at the same place at the same time. Those have been ideas that as a progressive early childhood educator, I have pushed back against a lot. And Greg, what about you? What do you think? Uh, I, think I think as a high school teacher, I'm thinking specifically about my seniors. Uh, I'm thinking that they're really losing that milestone of, of having that physical graduation, of having their prom, of having their senior trip. Uh, some of them, they'll be the first to graduate from high school in their family. So it was a very big moment for their family to, to have their son or daughter walk across that stage to receive that diploma. So I think it's just that memory that they'll never have, that milestone that they'll never have achieved uh, physically. What, do you, what would you like to see happening in the fall? Where do you want to be physically in the fall in terms of your teaching? And what have all of you, including our parent, learned about this that you think might affect teaching in the future? Anyone want to start? I could start by just saying if all things are safe, I really hope that the kids can go back to school in September. I think it's been really hard for children to learn this way and to be separated from one another this way. So I'm, I'm hopeful that he'll be able to return to school in whatever form it looks like in, in September. Rafa, what about you? Yeah, I, I also likewise ideally would want to go back in September. My one fear is that if we set up to go back, and then there's another outbreak, and then we have to change the routine again, that that, for at least for some kids, could be even more unsettling. So I'm very, I'm very conflicted. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, Greg, Eileen, what do you think, going back? What have we learned about this that might help us? I think I would definitely like to go back. Um, I'm curious how a blending learning model could kind of get us the best of both worlds with some flexibility, um, but also having that in-person component. I think what I've learned is that um, teaching and learning is so dependent on relationships and relationship building happens best when we're in person. And so if there is some kind of blend of in-person and remote, um, really leveraging that in-person time to build relationships and be able to build on that when we are remote. Right. Greg, final, final thoughts. Yes, I think Eileen really said that perfectly. Um, I myself, I'm going to be planning as if this is what school will look like in September. And if I'm pleasantly surprised, great. But I think what we now have as educators this summer is that opportunity to prepare, plan, create, so that September can look a little bit different. If we are sort of stuck home again, uh, it could look a little bit different. I want to thank you all for joining me today. We are out of time. I think your insights have been so helpful and helping us make sense of something so new and difficult. So I thank you all. I want to wish you all a wonderful summer. And I want to thank all of our viewers for joining us for this edition of EdCast. Keep safe, be well. We hope to see you all in the fall. I'd like to hear from you. Please send your thoughts and comments to cunyedcast at gmail.com.